Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I will start with Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? I don't believe she's here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jamison, do we have a quorum? We have three members. That is a quorum. Ms. Jamison. Yes. Please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Here. Mr. Fletcher. Here. Ms. Mana. Here. Mr. Saris? Mr. Saris? You're on mute. All right, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Saris is here. Thank you. Ms. Burnoff? Present. Dr. Scriven? Present. Ms. King? Here. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Our first item is the comprehensive annual financial report. And for that, I call on Mr. Sarris to provide a brief overview of the importance of this audit to the school system and Ms. King to present the audit results. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, and good afternoon to all the members and staff. The, uh, I guess the most important thing about this, uh, the annual financial audit and associated report is that it is required by law um, in Article 5, uh, Article 5 of the Education Article, Section 109. Uh, it's also a reflection of of our professional standards for both government accounting and generally accepted auditing principles and accounting principles. Um, it's an expression of full transparency uh, by sharing our financial statements with the public. Um, and uh, it's a measure of our credit worthiness uh, as well. So, uh, as you know, we, we do an annual lease purchase of vehicles. We do 
a number of leases for devices. Uh, we issue purchase orders that are accepted by vendors. And these audited financial statements uh, are essential to conducting all of those activities as we have done uh, historically because uh, they, they give a measure of reliability to the outside world uh, on our ability to, to pay our debts and to properly account for uh, taxpayer revenues that are shared by the state and the county and so forth. It, um, it does differ from a management audit, which is more akin to the procurement audit or the legislative audit. Uh, but uh, as Ms. King will indicate, there are uh, sometimes uh, management recommendations that are included as part of, of this report. Um, I don't believe we have any this year. And I will uh, introduce Ms. Sherry King, who is a director with Clifton Larson, LLC, and uh, she uh, managed this year's audit as she has for a number of years. And I'll turn it over to Ms. King. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. And thank you um, for having me here today. Once again, um, I look forward to coming and, and seeing you all uh, annually um, as I have in the past and, and appreciate um, uh, the attention tonight. Um, also want to say just a quick thanks to George and his group. As always, um, this audit has to be turned around within 90 days after uh, your fiscal year end, June 30th. And that is a, is a really, uh, it's a tall order <laughs> considering everything that has to be done in those 90 days to close out the, the books of the school and then also for us as an, uh, an outside firm to come in and audit them all in order to have the comprehensive annual financial report finished um, and issued in time for the Maryland State Department of Education's uh, compliance deadline of September 30th. Um, I also just want to kind of add uh, to George's statement as well. Um, because you are a component unit of Baltimore County, your financials also are included in Baltimore County's uh, financial statements as well. So I know they'll be looking um, for these uh, reports um, probably within the next week or two, to be honest, so they can get their audit done. Um, I just want to quickly go over um, how the audit went this year, um, some required communications um, that were required to make to the audit committee as part of our audit, and then I also just kind of want to give a, a quick status update on the single audit as well. Um, in terms of the financial audit or the CAFR audit, uh, we did issue an unmodified audit opinion this year. That is um, what I call in layman's terms a, a clean opinion, a good opinion. Um, it's the highest level of assurance that we can provide on the statements. Um, but I do also want to highlight, and I think most of you guys have gotten a copy of the CAFR this year or seen it in the past. That document is a management document. That document, probably well over 200 pages, uh, is put together by management. Um, we just audit the numbers in there. We don't, we're not responsible for the presentation, um, but we are responsible for the three page audit opinion that is in the front of those statements. So I just want to highlight that management does put that document together. We do not as the auditing firm. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is, um, we did not have any, what we consider material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. Uh, which is very good. I know in the past we probably have had some, um, if you go back a ways, but this year is in probably the most recent year or two, we have not had any findings, nor did we have any um, management letter comments either for the audit. Um, the audit, of course, just like I think everything else in our professional and personal lives, was affected by COVID this year. Um, we were just getting ready to start our preliminary field work um, in April when, when COVID hit. Um, and of course that made us um, kind of rethink how we were gonna go about doing the audit this year. Um, the audit was for the most part remotely done. Um, in the past, we would come on site for several weeks and, and camp out in a conference room. 
um, probably disturbed management more than they liked. Um, but um, this year we did it remotely with just a, a few kind of touch points um, on site as needed if there were documents that we needed to um, review in person if they were um, not available electronically or too voluminous uh, per se to scan in. Um, but those were, were very minimal. Um, very thankful to management for providing all that information electronically. Um, it definitely made the audit process go a lot smoother. Um, we did have probably more meetings than normal than we have with George and his team, um, just to make sure that we were staying on track um, throughout the audit, make sure we were getting what we needed and they you know, knew what was outstanding um, to vet through any um, questions that we had. Um, so those touch points, those meetings, like I said, are a little bit more than normal that we had. That's because we weren't on site to have that inner, that face-to-face, -face, you know, we're here, let's kind of, you know, talk through some things. We wanted to make sure that we were still keeping the communication going throughout the audit. So we do appreciate those as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of highlight, um, was in terms of the CAFR, if you compare it to last year's, it's very similar. We did not have any new accounting standards this year that we had to implement. Um, so if you look at the note disclosures um, and things of that nature, they're very similar to last year. We just updated the numbers um, and maybe a few sentences as needed. Um, we were scheduled to implement a new accounting standard in fiscal year 20, that's um, GASB 84 related to fiduciary activities. Um, however, when the pandemic hit, um, GASB, which is the standard setting for governmental accounting, um, decided that they were going to allow a one-year delay um, in that implementation. So we will be implementing standards next year that would have been um, uh, applicable for FY20 had the pandemic, pandemic not occurred. So um, it kind of was nice to have a reprieve. Um, given everything going on, that we weren't worried about a new standard. Um, although management, George's group, we actually were working back last winter to implement the standard. So we kind of got started and got our feet going and then kind of, you know, put the brakes on it. So uh, we'll be, you know, working with them this winter again in the off season to um, figure out how the new standard is going to affect the financial statements going forward. Um, so uh, a little light on the new accounting standards this year, but I, I, it was very much welcome to not have to worry about um, that in, in the year of COVID. Um, a couple of things I kind of wanted to mention, um, as in prior years, um, your statements do have several significant accounting estimates. These are the same estimates that we've had in the past. Um, but I am uh, required to make sure that you're aware of it because obviously if an estimate is subject to change down the line, if circumstances were to change. Um, these estimates include uh, your depreciable lives for fixed assets. Um, they also include um, for your workers' compensation, since you're self-insured, there are um, incurred claims at June 30th that were not reported. Um, so that is an estimate um, in the financial statements. And then lastly, your estimates related to your pension and your other post-employment benefit liabilities. Uh, those last two estimates are actuarial liabilities. We do rely on um, third-party actuaries to determine the calculations. There are accounting standards around the assumptions that the actuaries can use for those calculations. And we do review that um, with the actuary's report for reasonableness and compliance with standards, as well as the industry as a whole, um, when we um, when we review the specialist report um, for those liabilities that are included in the statements. Um, again, these are all liabilities that have been there for several years. Um, nothing new per se for fiscal year 20. Um, and lastly, I just want to kind of mention we didn't really have any difficulties. Throughout the engagement, um, other than just you know the just keeping in touch related to COVID and make sure that things were still moving, um, we did not have any corrected misstatements or uncorrected misstatements. So we did not notify management that any of the numbers needed to be corrected um, for the financial statements to be materially um, stated. And we had no disagreements with management either throughout the course of the audit. So 
as in prior years, I mean, I think we have a good working relationship with George and his group, um, and we very much appreciate all their help. The other thing I want to mention, too, is um, this audit, while most probably think that we just mainly deal with the accounting department, we actually touch a lot of departments throughout the school system. Um, we do work with your IT folks um, in depth in your IT controls, um, purchasing, HR, payroll, all kinds of um, places that we're kind of reaching out to different people throughout the school system. So um, overall, we're very appreciative of everybody's cooperation and we always get, you know, um, great cooperation from everybody, of course. A little long-winded. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Sherry, point? you might. Were you going to mention um, the single audit report? Okay. Yeah. I was going to see if I made questions on the CAFR before I kind of okay. switched gears. Committee members, are there questions? Mr. Kuhn. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. King. I appreciate the, the insight. Um, one of the questions I have, and I'm I'm just kind of thumbing through this massive report now. Uh, I think it came this afternoon via email. Um, but one of the things that I was curious about is the impact of, um, or basically, wh what is our, our position? And it's probably outlined in here, but you know, we have, you know, we provide food service um, to significant significant amounts of, of, of food to people across the system. And the the income that helps offset that evaporated when schools closed. And I guess my question is, what position has that left um, the school system in uh, from that point on through the end of the, you know, we're only talking through 20, June 20. 30th, 2020, but I was curious as to where that left us in that. And I haven't gotten to the numbers yet, but I wanted to ask that question. So that's a very good question. That kind of probably leads into um, my status update for the single audit. So I think I'll, I'll kind of address both if that's okay. Um, so looking at your, your net position for food service, you did have a loss of roughly $3 million this year, um, but that you had a, a, a good, uh, net position to offset that deficit. So at the end of the day, while this year you lost a little bit of money, you've made money in prior years to offset that, if that makes sense. Uh, and one of the reasons being is because uh, while you weren't, while you didn't have children in school, and George, you can correct me if I'm, you know, if there's anything you need to add, um, but while you didn't have children in school, so you weren't getting the revenue from the kids that are paying lunch, going through the lunch lines, you were still getting reimbursed at the federal level for meals that were being distributed through other federal programs. Um, one of those programs that you guys used for food service was um, a new COVID fund, um, a new COVID grant, I mean, it's the ESSER grant is what it's called. Um, and I probably should know this, it's early, it's elementary and secondary stabilization relief, I think is what ESSER stands for. Um, I think I'm close, George. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but what happened was with, you know, as most of you guys probably have heard, um, you know, the federal government had a, several different stimulus packages in the spring, um, the most notable one being the CARES Act that funneled a lot of money down through state and local governments, including education. Um, so, you know, Mr. Kuhn, in response to your question, a lot of that money was used um, and available to be used that offset the food service. Um, this year. So uh, if you did not have that federal money, you probably would have had a more substantial loss this year than you did. Okay, I appreciate that. And and I guess my, my next question is really for George and, and Mr. Scriven going forward. Um, um, we're in the same position now with food service, right? And I was just curious, are, are is the reimbursement rate that we're getting from the federal government and or the state in combination going to cover that amount or do we expect some kind of loss there depending on how long this goes? Yeah, we are essentially back to where we started in March. Um, we are uh, paying our employees. We're providing um, the the meal program that started in March continued through the summer 
and was extended again uh, this fall. So we're still providing meals uh, at no charge to our students. Uh, and we will, we're essentially now using our, uh, our account, our fund balance to absorb those costs. At some point, um, we will provide the board with a uh, projection of how the fund balance is being drawn down, and we will be able to make a recommendation on, in, on a, applying some of our remaining CARES grant funds to, um, to refresh the fund balance in the enterprise fund. Um, but uh, without any use of grant funds, um, we will significantly draw down on that fund balance throughout the course of the current fiscal year. Do you have any projection as to what the impact? Are we talking 3 million? or 10 million um, or 50 million? Our, what we experienced last spring was about uh, a $2 million a month figure, a drawdown. So, um, and we've kept about half of the CARES grant um, set aside because it's good through September of 2022. And until we know what kind of uh, support we're going to get from the county and the state for our regular operations. Um, we won't know whether we have uh, the ability to, uh, to support the enterprise fund uh, or whether we need uh, to use those funds for general operations instead. So there, there are lots of um, unanswered questions for us at this point. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Ms. Causey, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, Go ahead, thank please. You, Ms. Thank you, Ms. King, for that report. And thank you, Mr. Sears, um, for your work supporting um, Clifton Gunderson. And I just wanted to ask um, first, I have a couple of questions, so I'll just try and go quickly. But um, when you spoke to the difference between your audit and the external audit, like we had a UHY external procurement audit, and then we had uh, <clears throat> Office of Legislative Audit, what, what, could you just clarify what the distinctions are between your audit and those? Um. So from an external audit standpoint, we do use materiality in our audit. Um, so we're not looking at every dollar. We're looking um, for material items that are misstated. Um, I think that's a big distinction between our audit and what um, I know the legislative auditors are doing um, and, and, and UHY. Um, typically, from my understanding, um, obviously I was not involved in the UHY audit, but that my understanding was a very narrow focused on certain items, whereas I'm looking at the school system across the board, if that makes sense, um, from a materiality standpoint. Legislative auditors um, typically come in and do what I would consider a deep dive into your operations. They're looking um, not only to make sure everything is accurate, but also a lot of times looking um, for um, ways that you can be efficient or efficiencies that can be gained. They're looking at best practices, things of that nature as well, um, is what they're concentrating on. I think um, from my review of legislative findings at different school systems across Maryland, a lot of their um, work seems to be trying um, to find ways where maybe you could save money, be more efficient, things of that nature um, as well. Thank you. That's helpful. To help. <laughs> The other um, question I had is in your projections when you were going over, um, excuse me, the estimates and you said they were same as last year. I missed the first item that you mentioned. Oh, 
Sure. The est the, the first estimate was depreciable lives for capital assets. So, uh, for example, we don't always know every capital asset how long it's going to last you. There are many factors that go into how long, say, a building will last, how you know how you take care of it, how you maintain it, things of that nature. Uh, but there is a counting guidance around groups of fixed assets. So, for example, buildings, there's a counting guidance on how long a building typically lasts, and that's what we use for depreciation purposes. Um, same for um, example, um, you know, furniture, desk, things of that nature. There's guidance around um, what the typical lifespan would be of those assets, and we apply that guidance against um, the depreciation. Okay, thank you. And the um, Office of Internal Audit did a um, fixed asset report that was shared with the board. Um, I want to say pre-pandemic. <laughs> um, <laughs> But some somewhere in that time frame. So is that a report that you would use in terms of um, adjusting estimates for depreciated lives? No, not not typically. When we use the counting guidance that goes around it, um, I, I don't know. I have did not see that report to be honest with you. So I'm not quite sure what the scope of that was, um, and if it dealt with how long fixed assets last. Um, and again, it, it's an estimate, it's guidance, it's not um, exact. Obviously, you can have, you know, two vehicles, same vehicle side by side, and they can depreciate at different levels, you know, um, depending on, like I said, how you take care of them, maintenance, things like that. Okay. And so when you're speaking to um, materiality, mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say that that addresses the um, relative size of the issue. So for instance, is there, um, so we have school activity funds. Mm -hmm. So is there a um, $100,000 discrepancy in a school's activity funds versus is there $25? So is materiality relating to the size, the relative size of the dollar value? Um, so, so for a an entity such as yourselves and the complexity of your financial statements, we actually have different materialities depending on what we're reviewing. Um, so, for example, your general fund, your main operating account, because of the size of that um, fund, the materiality is different than what we would have over, for example, the food service fund because they are different sizes in terms of dollar amounts and things like that. So, obviously, if we have a fund like a food service, which might be smaller in scope, our materiality is going to be less. Does that so answer could, your question? <laughs> it does. And I'm just curious if you could give me an example of two different funds and their total dollar value and what would be considered material. So I can't disclose materiality. Um, if I disclose materiality, I would... Um, have to change our whole audit next year, which might cost you all more money. Um, so materiality is something that we keep very close to us. But um, the example I would give would be similar to kind of what I said. The general fund is your larger fund. The majority of your transactions for the school system go through the general fund. So um, it is larger from an asset and revenue standpoint and expenditure standpoint. Therefore, we would have a, a higher materiality on that fund versus a smaller fund such as the food service or even, um, for example, your um, in internal service fund, which is your workers' compensation fund, which is uh, very small in scale compared to the general fund. Okay. Well, I certainly don't want you to share anything that will make you have to change the assessment, right? That's what they <laughs> – that's what in the uh... – instructional world. They want to guard that assessment. <laughs> we do. We, we guard the materiality very, very tightly. <laughs> maybe, maybe I could add something to that um, discussion by referring back to a previous audit and it related to the, the food service fund and uh, some revenues from the state. Um, and I think the amount of uh, that was that was mentioned in the audit was about two hundred forty thousand dollars, and and the food service fund is what forty seven million something like that. So um, I th maybe that gives uh, some perspective 
relative to the size of the fund and the the amount that was was uh, highlighted. Um, Right. So, so we appreciate that we're paying for a service from the auditors and that um, while we want to be mindful of every single dollar that moves through the taxpayers' hands and our funding authorities into uh, the Board of Education's coffers and then gets spent on the children, we want to make sure everything, everything is used to the highest value for our students. Um, but in terms of paying for professional auditors to track things down, it's not... Um, a good use of the money paying for them to track down a $5 issue when you're talking about, as you mentioned, a $47 million budget. So, okay, I just wanted to understand a little more about that. Um, and there's a, just to kind of add to, I mean, obviously there's a cost benefit to every decision that's made. You wouldn't want to pay me to hunt down every $5 um, dollars in, in the financial statements. Um, I would charge a lot more than that. Sorry, <laughs> but that's. Uh, but then, but you also have to offset that. You have your internal, a very robust internal audit department that can help um, investigate and look into things such as that. Um, you also are, are very highly audited by Maryland State Department of Education and legislative auditors, which again do more of a deep dive into different areas within the school system. Um, they do a risk assessment around the school system, and you know where. Um, where they might be the most bang for their time um, to to look into those types of more finer items, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. So and then in, in terms of um, estimates, moving forward when the school system makes um, project makes our budget, it's based on the projections of a certain number of students. So is there anything that is in this audit or would be coming in a future audit to understand the uh, difference because of the pandemic, any changes that we would have in our projections or how those impact our operating budget? I'm trying to I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you talking about the estimates I was referring to yes. previously, Do like the OPEB and pension? Yeah. Okay. So um, one thing about government financial statements, they are a little tricky. Um, those estimates are not booked at the budgetary level. So these estimates are in the government-wide level of the statements, which is, um, I'll be very frank, most people don't even really look at those. And that's not how the school system runs um, itself. The school system um, manages, George and his group, and, and as a board, you manage based on your budgetary statements, um, and those estimates are not recorded at the budgetary level. If that makes okay. sense. It's a little, it gets a little complicated. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So. Um, that's all the questions I have at this time. Okay. Um, in the spirit of maybe being overly simplistic, can someone please define materiality? Because that went right over my head, and I have no clue how to understand this conversation without understanding the definition of that word the way that you're using it. Um, so uh, materiality for an audit is a calculation that we do. Um, it, it can be based on revenues. It can be based on expenditures. I, I'm probably not going to give you a very simplistic answer, to be honest with you. But it could be based on a number of factors um, that we have at our disposal. It's a calculation um, that as an auditing firm, we do on every job. And for a job like this, like I said, we have multiple materiality levels. Um, and it's the guide that we use to determine um, anything below that level would be what we consider immaterial. Um, and we probably wouldn't, if we found an error, would not need to be um, recorded or adjusted for the statements to be materially stated. Um, but if you go over that level, then we would need management to make corrections to the statements if we were to find an error. Obviously, I can't give you a, an exact dollar amount of materiality. It's just that that level that we, you know, look at when we sit there and we find an error, we determine where it goes on the materiality scale and whether or not management has to book the adjustment or not. 
So I assume that that is a formula that you come up with because you said you don't share it. So um, do you that's decide? Based on auditing guidance. That's based okay. on the ICPA auditing guidance. So we don't just make our own formula out of thin air. Right. So it's a professional standard mm -hmm. that auditors use. Um, I guess my question is, is that materiality standard consistent across the entire audit for like each transaction or can circumstances change the materiality? Um, circumstances don't typically change the materiality, but like I said, depending on um, your, your statements include many different funds. So depending on what fund we're looking at, the materiality can mm -hmm. be different. Obviously, we're not going to assess a higher materiality on a fund that has very low dollars because then we wouldn't be looking at anything. I see. Um, during our audit. So we want to adjust the materiality down for those funds that are smaller in nature. So that way we are looking at items and, you know, and, and auditing. I guess okay. I say. So I don't want to take the whole fund and say it's not material and throw it out the window and never look at anything related to it, if that makes sense. I think I understand. So basically your job as it relates to the school system is to audit the school system based on the standards that you create according to auditing standards mm -hmm. and then to supply a report of our expenditures, et cetera, to say that what the school system's telling us is accurate. Materially accurate, accurate. So material accurate being accurate within a certain range, mm -hmm. is that fair? Right, right. That, so for you example, know, if something's $5 off, it can, we let it be $5 off, if that makes sense. We don't consider that material. Okay, so within an established range. So like when I balance my checking account, if it's 32 cents off, I've decided I don't care about that, adjust it, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm exactly. not going to track down 32 cents. Exactly. So in your case, for each fund or for each thing you're auditing, you establish what the margin of error, so to speak, is. And then you're auditing to make sure that things are consistent with those parameters. Is that an accurate understanding? Okay. That's accurate. I apologize for taking up time for my own personal advocation, but I just needed to understand that in order to understand anything that we just talked about. No, it's it's a very good distinction to make because I mean we I mean that's the whole crux of our opinion is that we are using materiality. So I can't give absolute assurance that every dollar in the financial statement is accurate. So that would be false on my part to, to say that to you all. So, I just wanna, so it is important that we understand okay. that there is materiality in play. So generally speaking, it's accurate. Right. But if some transaction comes up that's not accurate, this audit was meant to be general mm -hmm. to a point. Is that a fair lay term way of saying it? Um, yes. Okay. Because I, so, yeah. I need to be able to explain this to voters. <laughs> So, all right. So, um, learn on your own time. Go ahead. Oh, Miss Joes. Miss Joes, did you have any questions about the CAFR um, audit? I oh, go yes. ahead, Miss Joes. Um, it just came to us right now, and I look at a lot of comprehensive annual reports in my job, so I really don't have a question on the way you do things. Um, you know, I. I do need some time to look at it, though, because we just got it. I don't know if the other board members got it previously. Um, no, we did. We did all just get it at the same time. As soon okay, as I so, got it, I forwarded it. OK, I mean, I have to look at it before I have any questions. And it looks like, Miss, you know, um, a lot of the questions you're asking looks like it's something that's basic financial thing. And I think Mr. Kuhn probably has a good financial background. So that's something that I think should be either coming to the full board as well the CAFR, which, you know, I think is standard practice. Is that right, Ms. King? Uh, that would be, Mr. Saris would distribute yeah, that. Yeah, th this, this report will be presented to the full board in at the second meeting in November. And um, we'll, at that point, you'll have had time to review it and, and may have additional questions that we'll be happy to answer. And I have reviewed the previous one, so thank you. So, Ms. Joes and other committee members, if you have questions, 
specific to the report that we got today when you're reading it. If you um, forward me those questions, I will forward them to staff and ask that they facilitate the answers to those questions so that the committee members have an understanding of this, if that's satisfactory to everyone. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. King, I understand you had some additional information to share. I did real quick. I, I know we're taking up a good bit of your time, so I thank you. No, uh, that's I fine. Go ahead. I wanted to give a quick update on the single audit. The single audit is an audit of your federal grant expenditures. Um, so any federal funding that you receive and, and spend during the year um, is reflected in that audit. That audit is due to um, MSDE by the end of December. Typically, um, at this meeting, we have the single audit either completed or substantially completed. Um, we might just be kind of putting the, the, you know, dotting our I's and crossing our T's at this point. Um, unfortunately, this year, that is not the case, and I wanted to kind of give you an update as to why. Um, the reason being is, um, and I kind of alluded to with Mr. Kuhn's question, um, the school system did receive substantial federal funding related to COVID. Um, that funding um, can be spent as early as March and through, there's different deadlines, but some of them are up to two years. Um, and Baltimore schools did spend some of that COVID funding in fiscal year 20. Uh, what that means is on, um, in the single audit report, we do have to audit that COVID funding. Um, when it comes to auditing grants, uh, we do rely on the um, federal government, the Office of Management and Budget, to supply what we call a compliance supplement. Um, the federal um, agencies that oversee their grants put together um, what they consider um, uh, procedures that they want us to test as part of the single audit, and that's what we incorporate when we look at your grants. Um, so, for example, um, Title I is, is a grant that we test very routinely. Um, U.S. Department of Education determines the procedures that they want us to test and put it in that compliance supplement. And then we pull that down, and that's basically our audit guide or our audit program. We test Title I. Um, so that kind of just kind of gives you a, a very brief overview of how we test the single audit. It is different from the CAFR in that respect. We're testing more compliance with grant requirements um, in the single audit. With the COVID grants, that part of the compliance supplement, that guidance from the feds has not been issued yet. They are behind on providing that guidance. Um, they expect it to come down, I, I'm hoping by early November, um, but we were told sometime this fall. So um, without a compliance supplement for the COVID funding, we can't be sure exactly what the federal government wants us to test. Um, we do have an idea of um, normal testing procedures that we do that we have, are gonna start one just to kind of keep things moving. Um, but we will not be able to complete the single audit and issue the report until we get that guidance from the federal government. Um, at this point, I don't see a problem with meeting your um, MSDE required deadline of the end of December. It's just unfortunately not gonna be done um, as early and for this meeting as in the past that we would like to see. So we are also in addition to testing the COVID funding, we're also testing Title I this year, um, which was up for rotation. We test that every three years. So Title I's the other um, major single audit program that we're looking at for fiscal year 20. And that program has been started and, and we've made significant progress on that program already. Um, that program is a normal program that we already have guidance for um, and we're not waiting on the feds for any information for Title I. Okay, so what is the general timeline for the completion of those two things? At this point, I do not know because we're waiting on the federal government for guidance. Um, CLA as a firm has made a decision that we will not issue any single audit reports until we get that guidance from the feds. Um, because if we issue a report and test a COVID program and we don't have the guidance and we miss testing something, that's a significant risk. So 
um, we won't issue any reports until we have the COVID guidance from the feds and we're able to review it and, and appropriately test the programs in accordance with that guidance. And they've given you no timeline as to when to expect that guidance? It's fall. I've heard early November, but that's a... Okay. <laughs> It's the feds. We're at their mercy, unfortunately. <laughs> so perhaps I could add that um, that the the major expenditure that occurred in fiscal year 20 relates, I believe, to the uh, reimbursement of the food services fund. Uh, which is primarily, which are primarily the payroll-related expenses for keeping our staff employed. Um, as we talked about, the the cost of the food has been reimbursed through the separately through the USDA program, um, and so the unreimb our un our unrecovered costs were really for payroll, and so. My staff have done a lot of the preliminary work to document those payroll expenses for which we got the reimbursement. And so we're, we feel that we're positioned as soon as the guidance comes out to provide Ms. King and her firm with, with all the informa information they, we think they will need to, to perform their due diligence. Okay, Ms. Kazi has questions. Yes, I just wanted to say um, that certainly makes sense that work has not been done with if the um, if the procedures have have not been <laughs> provided. So that certainly makes sense, and I would imagine that um, just like the st state superintendent waived a number of requirements of um, LEAs uh, throughout this um, pandemic, um, that there's. There's, there would be some understanding if um, if you and we don't meet that deadline. So that's certainly reasonable. Um, and just real quick, I don't, I mean, at this point, I'm not trying to alert a panic button here or anything like that. I don't think that there would be a problem. Um, the, the funding that was spent was not a, a, a it was only, it's roughly four and a half million dollars. So to audit that's probably not going to be too time consuming. We just want to make sure that we don't miss picking up anything that needs to be done before we issue the single audit. So, okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, as you review um, the auditor's report, I just want to point out on, I think on page 22, you'll find uh, Clifton Larson Allen's opinion, and at the top of that page, under bold heading opinions is sort of the sum and substance of, of the opinion, which says uh, that the financial statements uh, fairly present in all material aspects, the financial position uh, of BCPS. So that, and that's the standard language that's used for a, an unmodified opinion and it may not, uh, it doesn't delve in any more detail than, probably less detail than we've discussed here, but you may want to start by reviewing that opinion um, for, uh, for any questions that you have in November. Okay, and I would just like to um, ask if Ms. Barr um, who's the head of our Office of Internal Audit, has any questions of either of you regarding this, or has she been involved in the process? I wanted to give her the opportunity for the sake of the committee in the office to ask questions if she has any. Thank you. Um, hi, Sherry and, and okay. George. I just wondered, does MSDE still conduct desk review or do quality control review of your work papers? Uh, yes, they do. Um, MSDE does a desk review of every audit of the school system uh, annually. Um, basically, the desk review, um, from my understanding, uh, as they go through the, the CAFR, 
um, and in the reports that we issue um, to make sure everything looks according to standards. They might ask us a question or two based on that desk review. Um, every three years, uh, MSDE comes out and actually reviews our work papers um, associated with the audit. So they do take a deep dive into both the CAFR and the single audit work papers um, as like their due diligence to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing in accordance to the standards. So yes, they still do that, Andrea. Okay, I just I just wonder, and you said every three years? It's every three years. It's every three years unless you switch accounting firms, okay. and then it'd be the first year of a new accounting firm. Okay, so when was your last three year? Um, well, it wasn't. 19 so it was either 17 or 18 i'm not quite sure okay and i'm sorry if i missed this did you um explain what programs you were testing in single audit were you doing ofns this year no we're doing title one okay um, and then we're doing the esser grant which um that money was spent on food service they still do type a type b yes mm -hmm. okay yeah, unfortunately, the ESSER grant, the COVID grant, was an actual type A because it exceeded the $3 million threshold. <laughs> so. And, and Andrea, just, you know, for your knowledge, um, the school system is a low-risk auditee, so we only required to audit 20% of the federal expenditures on the CFA. Okay. Um, I did have a question about the, the delayed implementation of, of GASB 84. You said that we started to um, implement, and that has to do with school activity funds, correct? It does. Um, it does have to do with um, school activity funds no longer being a fiduciary fund. Um, they will most likely um, either most likely be rolled into the general fund. Um, we, as a firm, held roundtables last winter with um, the school systems across the state to, we brought them into our office to have a discussion as it affects, you know, every school system. Um, what that looks like with Maryland and in relation to Maryland, you know, compliance regulations um, on your CAF or what it would look like if they're no longer fiduciary funds, how they would get rolled back into uh, the financial statements. Um, and things of that nature. So we had some really, really good discussions with uh, representatives from all the major LEAs um, last winter, um, had a couple follow-up items um, that we were gonna do, um, and then COVID hit. <laughs> so we do plan to resume and have those discussions um, once again this winter to finalize um, the implementation um, for FY21. Okay, thank you very much. I have no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Do any committee members have any further questions about this? No, no more questions for me, thank you. Okay, seeing none, if anyone does have further questions as you're reading it, please email me those questions and I will facilitate getting those responses for the committee members from staff. And um, Committee members, is it appropriate for the CAFR to be sent to the full board so that the full board can begin to think about questions they might have? I think George presents it at some point at the, in, to the whole board, right, Mr. Sayers? Yes, we'll, uh, what you have is, is our very last draft before we read it once more and print it, um, but it's the sum and substance is final. Uh, all the statements are final, no numbers will change. Um, and we will uh, add that through board docs to a board agenda um, and present it to the full board that way. Mr. Saris, is it fair to say that the full board will get this a bit earlier than this committee got it? Because we got, got this documented yeah. approximately three something or whatever. It was very close to the start of this committee meeting. And if we're not going to distribute this document to the full board to prepare their questions, I would like to make sure that the final document gets distributed the full five days out that yes. board docs full, is required. 
Right. That's okay. when the board and will have the final document. But this document contains the signatures and uh, and the only thing that would change would be some spelling mistakes that we might okay. find in our review. The financial statements are final. Okay, so you're just copy editing at this point. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. So we will move on to the next item of business. And um, that would be the audit committee and internal audit charters. And I guess I just wanted to start by asking Ms. Barr to be available for questions. If, if staff need, if staff are finished with this portion of the meeting, you're free to leave. Um, I know that some of you were only here for the CAFR presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. And Ms. Sherry, Ms. thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Rowe, this is, uh, oh. this is Dr. Spriven. I, I just wanted clarity. Should I stay on? I, I don't mind, or should I be excused as well? Um, it, it's I your call. That's why I'm I, at. I think that it could be beneficial for your edification to stay. Yeah, then I have no problem doing on that. That's why I asked. <laughs> How's that for Thank an you. answer? <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. That's, uh, I can. Okay. Um, all right. So we're. Excuse me, Ms. Rowe. Are we moving yeah. to unfinished business or, or are we going to do the second report um, under reports? Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Did I read the. You know what? I was going to skip ahead. I'm sorry. So yes, Ms. Barr, we need to do the FY21 Office of Internal Audit quarterly update. Thank you. So if you would thank you for stopping me, please proceed. Can everybody see the document? Yes, thank you. This is our first um, go round with providing quarterly updates to the audit committee and hopefully uh, to the board. So I have used the format that I typically use for the mid year and the year end updates. And if you all are OK with that, um, we will continue to present the information in this format. However, if you would prefer to see the quarterly updates in a different fashion or a different manner with perhaps less narrative, uh, we can do that as well. But for today, we have our first quarter update. And, and as part of that, I will have Ms. Stevens report on the budget to actual hours used. I will have Mr. Fletcher include his statistical report um, related to investigations as um, part of this report as well. And Ms. Manna also explain what she has accomplished in the first quarter with the audit services unit. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Stevens to explain this chart. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're all aware, our staff uh, clocks their hours every day. Um, we have a timekeeping system that we use and we have managers review that time every week. That The time is then rolled into a monthly summary and we tie it back to our uh, budgeted hours. So for uh, as of September 30th, We've used um, just about 4,000 resource hours to complete our work plan. Uh, 3,000 of those were um, related to direct audit activities, which would be either investigations, our risk-based audits, or our continuous monitoring. Um, the rest of the hours that we used would have been for staff development, staff meetings, and general office responsibility. So with that, I will pass it over to Keith Fletcher. Thank you very much, uh, Deb. Uh, so as we go down, uh, I want to talk about the cases uh, that we have received um, into our office uh, for us to, to investigate. Uh, and for quarter one, for the first three months uh, of the fiscal year, you can see on the far left, uh, we have received 18 um, cases that we're going to take a look at. And a spattering of different issues. Um, in terms of the, the types of information that came in in the cases. Uh, and then to the far right, you can see that, that seven of the 18 
um, are actually management issues. And so as we scroll through into our next to our next page, I want to talk about how the allegations are actually classified. Um, and so, you know, we, we have our, our breakdown of fraud, waste, and uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, and then our, our other uh, non-fraud, waste, and abuse categories. So, of those four, um, really fairly evenly distributed amongst three of them. Um, you see, five uh, of the eighteen are fraud, six of the eighteen uh, were abuse, and then the remainder um, is falls into that that other category, that non-fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, and then scrolling down into our our next chart, we're actually going to start talking about those cases that we've closed now uh, for the first quarter. Uh, and so um, in the first quarter, we have closed 18 uh, cases. And you can see here the breakdown um, of, of the substantiation of, of those 18. And so we did substantiate one. Uh, five, we actually unsubstantiated. Uh, one was inconclusive, and then 11 fall into that um, a management issue to where we, we referred out to uh, management for their uh, review and disposition. And scrolling down, let's see. Oh, now I get to turn it over to Ms. Mana. Hello, thank you. So for the audit services side, in quarter one, um, we completed 27 um, audits, reviews, and follow-ups. Using um, data analytics, we identified schools that we wanted to complete a school activity fund or P-card audit. We looked at the seven schools where a change in principal had occurred, and using um, these data analytics and risk assessment techniques, we identified that three of those seven schools needed a full school activity fund and P-card audit. In addition to those three schools, um, we identified seven that required a risk-based audit, basically the same scope of a SAF and PCARD audit. So as for quarter one, we completed th all three of the change in principle um, audits and four of the risk-based audits. And the distribution of those reports went to the principal, fiscal assistant, the applicable community superintendent and executive director the superintendent, um, the chief academic officer, executive director of fiscal services, senior executive director of administrative services, and the chief auditor. Uh, we also completed using other data analytics for reviewing all PCARD transactions for all of the offices during the COVID period in fiscal year 20. So starting with March 16th all the way through the ending of um, the June 8th PCARD packet. We identified through those data analytics 21 offices that we wanted to do a more thorough review on. And we completed that project and sent the results of those, that review to the cardholder um, and the approving officials and also personnel and business services. The, uh, executive Director of Fiscal Services and the Senior Executive Director of Administrative Services. We are also working on, currently working on a summary of those, um, of that part of the re review of the offices and we'll be presenting that at a later date. Also in quarter one, for the continuous moder monitoring, our efforts were focused on the monitoring and of management responses of the corrective actions for the UHY report. And that was presented at the last audit committee um, for observations eight through 12, and we're currently working on the other observation at this time. So that's it for audit services unit and what we've been working on for quarter one. Thank you all. And um, as you'll note, we do have indirect hours charged to the plan and they they typically relate to staff development activities we have regular staff meetings um, these meetings with the, the audit committee other board meetings and uh, required meetings and just general office responsibility so at the end of the first quarter we spent about a thousand hours there um, at the end of the report I also do a summary of the audit committee activity but as you 
uh, see, we had no meetings in July or August, and our September meeting was rescheduled to October 6th. So in the, the second quarter update, you'll have uh, more information here related to the summary of the audit committee activity. So I open the floor for questions or any suggestions with respect to the type of information that we're communicating. And if you want to see something different, please let me know. Thank you. Committee members, are there questions or comments? Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, all of the staff for this report. And um, I just uh, wanted to ask, given the pandemic, are the, is there any difference relative in the hours through investigations or indirect? I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, you cut off and I didn't hear the entire question. Certainly. So I was just curious if um, you've done an evaluation for this time period from this year where we've been in the pandemic uh, compared to last year. I'm just wondering what, if any, impacts the pandemic has had on your workflow. Uh, we've been pretty steady with respect to workflow on both um, the audit services unit and the investigative unit. I do believe the um, the number of calls into the hotline are down a bit, um, but the nature of some of the calls that we get cause us to spend more time on certain investigations. And we've been, we, we really haven't missed a beat with respect to moving, um, working from home and working during through the pandemic and continuing to work um, in this mode. So we have not done a, a, a comparison, if you will, from this year to prior year, I would think that uh, on Keith's information, he would be able to demonstrate that a little bit more um, succinctly than on the audit services unit, but that could be something that we could bring forward to the next meeting if the uh, committee desires. Okay, thank you. I don't I don't know if it's material, so um, you and Ms. Rowe can um, assess that outside of the meeting. <laughs> okay. No problem. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Mr. Kuhn? Well, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, Ms. Barr, one of the things that's standing out um, as I look on uh, th at the first page, the summary of plan hours, is the fact that it looks like the general office responsibilities, which is in essence overhead, right? It's already at 40.3% of expected budget and we're only in the first quarter. So my question to you is, do we need, is, are, are we, um, we're going to project to go, you know, significantly over this or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, I think what's a little bit different and what may have bumped the numbers up is, uh, the work on the charters and, um, the work plan and these quarterly updates. Uh, to, you know, that are being prepared for the board and for the audit committee. So that is something that um, we didn't know we were going to have to do. Um, so I think it'll probably start to level off some, Mr. Kuhn, and we can always take a look to make sure that folks are consistently recording um, the time where they're supposed to be. Now, Ms. Stevens, keeps a pretty good watch on that. And I would ask her to contribute if she had, has anything more to add with respect to answering your question. Uh, yeah, one other thing that is kind of bumping that up a little bit that should be slowing down is our, um, we are in the middle of completing and reviewing our SOPs that are required to be turned in by the end of December. So um, we're coming up on the tail end of that. So again, I think that has contributed a little bit to the front end of, of that category that that will slow down a little bit when we get towards uh, second, or I'm sorry, third and fourth quarters. Thank you, I appreciate that. I don't really have any other questions at this time, Ms. Rowe, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Jones, did you have any questions before I let Ms. Cosley go a second time? Has Ms. Has Ms. Joe's left the meeting? I don't see her on the list anymore. Um, 
I don't know. It does appear that she has left the meeting. Okay. Um, Ms. Causey? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. That's okay. Never mind. Are there any further questions? Okay, hearing none. Now we will move on to the next. So next is the audit charters that we've been working on. And we got a, the most recent draft today. It's not my intention that we vote on these today, but that we utilize um, a portion of the meeting as a work session. So what I would like to do is first ask any of the committee members if they have any questions about anything and let's start with the internal audit committee charter. Uh, the internal audit office charter or the audit committee charter? The audit committee charter. Ms. Rowe. Yes. I do have um, uh, a message or I do have a question. Um, so I, I recall looking at this um, previously um, and one of the things that um, I maybe I'm missing it uh, but one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we did uh, capture here um, even though it may be slightly different than what we're focused on most of the time is the academic piece of our organization. Um, here we talk about controls and accounting and financial, you know, ac activity, right? Uh, but part of what I think, I, I definitely don't want to miss the, um, the part of our mission that should be focused on making sure a solid education is provided, that policies that are associated with grading and um, attendance um, are also followed. Uh, so I think that there's things outside of maybe what's laid out here, and I'm not quite sure. I, I would think that it, it might, we might, might add it in the purpose or maybe even the role here to kind of say something along the lines of, and I don't have the language you know, That's fine. We can we can put together the language and bring yeah. it back in the next iteration of the draft. Ms. Barr, can you speak to what types of things the Office of Internal Audit does that relates to those academics? Sure. Right now, um, primarily, we've looked at, at those types of things through the investigative unit. But as we're moving more into risk-based and um, the use of data analytics, we'll be moving more towards the curriculum-based side with respect to um, those uh, concerns that Mr. Kuhn uh, mentioned. We have met with the uh, uh, Dr. Monique Wheat Wheatley Phillips to see how we can work together to come up with some strategies and approaches with respect to data analytics to perhaps touch on those um, areas that Mr. Kuhn mentioned. Also keep in mind if, if there is a, a particular project that the board or the superintendent would like us to do related to that, we are always available with regard to that. Um, but And we also do our work plan on an annual basis. So if that was something that was of an interest to the committee, and they wanted that to be included or incorporated into our work plan, that is always a possibility as well. Okay, does that address so your question? It does. So what would you call the category of audits that Mr. Kuhn is talking about? What What is the audit terminology for that? Would it be a, an academic audit? What would you call that? Program review, perhaps? Well, it depends on what the objective is and what the focus is. 
I um, guess what I'm looking for is under the role where we have A, B, and C on the charter document, mm -hmm. could there be a D and language that articulates what Mr. Kuhn is talking about? I, it's my belief that that would be incorporated or be part of um, letter A, which is the internal audit function. So again, keep in mind an audit committee primary role has to do with um, fiduciary responsibilities and specifically mm -hmm. related um, to the finances. But you're also um, there to provide assistance to the internal audit function and through the internal audit function, and I would suggest through the work plan, if there are those types of reviews, you could call it a review. I don't know necessarily that it would be an audit. It could be, um, it would just all depend on the function and the area that um, you would want us to look into, but it would certainly be able to be classified or considered as an audit activity if it makes sense for our office to review it versus something that should be completed by management and the superintendent and his staff. So we would have to make sure that it's something related to internal audit and not a management function or project. So I think what would be very helpful at this point for the discussion of this document is if we had some kind of a chart that titled all the different types of audits, investigations, reviews, all those different things that the Office of Internal Audit does, and then to categorize them so that the committee can see what it is that we do and what each of those things fits under as far as A, B, and C in the role, because it really, this document really doesn't mention the academic audits at all, but it is clear that we do them. And I know that the work plan has uh, explanations of things, um, but I think that we need to have some of that with our charter. Um, Ms. Causey, did you have comments? Ms. Causey? Yes, I was going to just make two. Uh, I had a comment and a question. So the comment is, um, to Mr. Kuhn's point, the Policy Review Committee is uh, currently evaluating um, our grading and reporting policy. And specifically, it was discussed um, at the PRC meeting, uh, not the most recent one, but the one before in September, um, to evaluate the the implementation of the policy through the grading and reporting procedures and to evaluate the impact of that implementation, which has been about uh, four years, and um, to evaluate how it aligns um, to the policy itself. So the um, Department of Curriculum, the Office of Curriculum, is going to be doing some evaluation and bringing us a report. Um, I think it was going to be November or December timeframe. So there, so there is an avenue through policy review committee, um, and I would think that that is also work in the curriculum committee um, that can be done regarding that. But also, I wanted to ask Ms. Barr if she could speak just a moment about the special education audit. I believe you did that was done several years ago um, that you thought had provided a lot of insight at the time. Uh, sure. That that audit was completed back in 1999, and what we did then is we actually um, did observations. We watched teachers interact with students. We reviewed IEPs. Um, we kind of used the guidance from the OMB that Ms. King was referring to earlier to make sure that students were receiving the services that they were supposed to receive. Um, I'm just trying to, because it was so long ago, I'm just trying to recall off the top of my head all of the different things uh, that we actually did with respect to that audit. But it was, uh, we did observations, we interviewed teachers, we reviewed IEPs, um, and there are rules, as you know, associated with 
uh, the special education program that needed to be followed. It's it's a pretty paper intensive program and um, deadlines, timelines, things of that nature. So we were making sure that notifications went out the way that they were supposed to, um, that meetings were held the way that they were supposed to, if meetings were canceled, um, that the proper documentation was in place. I'm sorry. I mean, I would have to try to find find that report, but those were the types of things that we looked at. Like I said, it, it was a pretty long time ago. Okay, thank you. I have, I have nothing are further. There, are there any other questions? I, I have no further questions right now. Thanks. Ms. Causey. Thank you. So um, on page one, uh, the paragraph labeled professionalism, and uh, then B, it says, the committee shall maintain confidentiality in the exercise of its duties and responsibilities regarding confidential information in accordance with the board's legal and ethical responsibilities. And I thought it might be helpful to outline specifically to include language, policy, and law, or, or policy, because actually legal is already included, but policy, and and then maybe, um, as you had talked to in, a, in another light, an appendix, or as we do in policy review committee, related policies, because there are a number of our policies that relate to um, activities that involve confidentiality. So, for instance, there's policies related to personnel, um, there's policies related to student data privacy, um, where confidentiality would be required in, um, very specifically, even if that was a report um, that would be shared with the board. So, so are, you, I, are you suggesting that at the bottom of the charter, like under the approved date or whatever, the same way we have before our implementation line and all of our policies, that we have the list of related policies? Yes. That's what you're, okay. Yeah, we, I mean, we can do that. I think that's a good idea. Ms. Barr, okay. would you make a note of that and then we can go over and itemize the policies for the next iteration of the draft? Yes, I did. Thank you. And, and um, so the only word that I would include it in on page one, professionalism paragraph B is responsibilities and board policy. And then it can be C related policies. So how would you like it to read? Um, you can just add at the end and board policies. Under? Um, where it says, so the sentence would end in accordance with the board's legal and ethical responsibilities and related board policies. Okay. And then the related board policies would be at the bottom of the document with the hot links to those policies like we do in our actual policies. Yes. So should I make that a motion? Um, no. You I don't just typed have. it into the document. I don't, yeah. Can you all Does, see the document? Does anyone object to Ms. Causey's suggestion? If no one objects, then we will add it to the next draft. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Barr, I had a question. In C of that professionalism, it says, the perception of the member's conflict of interest in the issue shall be considered in this decision. What does that mean? I think that goes in line with what Board Policy 8363 states with respect to conflict of interest is that even if there is a perception of conflict of, of interest, then it shouldn't happen. Um, it ties with the language that's in Policy 8363. So if there is, if there is even a perception of a potential conflict of interest, there may so there may or may not yeah. be a conflict of interest, but I if, see if what the you're, public perceives if, that to be, then so is there um 
if that's articulated in board policy 8363, then I think maybe we should delete that last sentence because outside the context of the policy that it's being pulled from, it doesn't really make sense. And it doesn't, it's not clear that it says what you're intending for it to mean, if that makes sense. Do the community yes. members concur? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, I'm through. suggesting that under professionalism and C that we delete the sentence, the perception of the member's conflict of interest in the issue shall be considered in this decision because the sentence itself doesn't really make sense. And the board policy 8363 fully articulates what's considered a conflict of interest and how a board member should determine whether that is. Does anyone object? So I, Ms. Rowe, I would, I'm trying to scroll through the policies to look at policy 8363. If that statement, the perception of the member's conflict of interest in the issue shall be considered in this decision, if that's included in the policy, then I think it may be redundant. Perhaps we should reword that sentence. It's a five-page policy. Um, I would, yeah. I, I would be comfortable um, having Ms. Barr review that policy in the language and, and see if in the next draft it needs to be modified. My only concern is I could see that sentence being interpreted a number of different ways, and if the, if the if policy eighty three sixty three is fairly exhaustive and it sounds like it is. I, I don't want to get into restating it. I, I don't have any disagreement with that, Ms. Rowe. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any comments, questions, suggestions for edits? I did have another um, question related to page one composition, the committee shall consist of an odd number of at least three members as determined by the board chair. Each member um, shall be independent and free. Okay, so my concern is with um, the shall in that because at different times we've had, um, if we have a board member um, leave the committee in one fashion or another where it would um, temporarily change that number. Um, so let's say we went, we had five members and one left for some reason, and then we were down to four. So do I, does the board chair have to not have someone come to the meeting or, you know, I'm, so oh, I'm just, I see what you're saying. So I, I maybe, think the word shall would be limited. Yeah. Um, so the committee or, so maybe it could say, um, where, reasonable or it's suggested. I, I just have concerns about setting that. And, and you know, sometimes there's- Making it more of a, a goal than a mandate. Yes, and if we have four members that want to be on it, then How would I would you think that four someone? members could be on it. Right. I, right, I, and I understand the, the issue is, was the issue that the odd number had related to taking a vote and there not being a tie? Yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. But the, you right. know, the other thing is in, in the way that our board works is you could have a tie, you could also have something just not get the required number of votes. There's, I don't see how a tie really matters for our committee work because either something gets the required number of votes and passes or it doesn't get the required number of votes. It's not like if you get a tie you're going to have the inability to move forward. Exactly, because you could have three members and one could abstain, and then it could still be a tie. Right, so, right. so I, from a parliamentary so I, I understand standpoint. The, right, I understand the goal, but I really don't think it's gonna be helpful um, for the board to be limited 
by yeah, that I, statement. I understand because if we had an odd number and another board member wanted to join the committee, we're certainly not going to prohibit them simply because two members don't want to join. Right. Um, that so makes maybe, sense. Ms. So Barr, would you make just, a note that we can address that issue? Mr. Kuhn, do you um, yes. agree with the reasoning? Well, it's a microcosm of our current board. There are 12 voting members, right? So <laughs> we can we can be deadlocked regardless. Right, exactly. So it's so, so I, yeah, I don't so know it's, if it's really material. Yeah. Okay. Or we could be unanimous. <laughs> okay. Right. That's but at all. the end of, at the end of the day, the the equivalent of a quorum is the deciding number of votes. It's in other words, the votes is not a majority rule. The votes is you have this number of people and if it ties it doesn't pass. Right. Okay, thank you. Um does anyone else have any questions, suggestions? I did have a general question. Go ahead. So is this document um, attached to the agenda similar to other committees that have drafts attached or? This document has not been attached. Okay. Um, would you like it to be attached? Should it be attached? Because it's kind of a working document that's changing rather frequently as as we go through it. I haven't really, I haven't really been um, having it attached. I guess my idea was that at the point that the committee had worked on it enough that we had something more finalized, that we would attach it at the point we we're actually going to vote on it. I see. Am I wrong in that thinking? Um, I'm not sure. In um, in other instances, the drafts are attached, so we're in an open meeting, and so uh, if the public wants to view the meeting, they can through live stream. They can see mm -hmm. the video minutes. But if they don't have the document, they're um, the document is being displayed. So, so maybe the, doc I the document is being displayed on screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, let's um, move to the next agenda item. Let me bring up the agenda. Okay, um, so the the charter audit will continue on to unfinished business. And the last item on the agenda is something that I wanted to discuss. One of the things that other school systems do that our school system should do is give our Office of Internal Audit some face time with the full board to be able to report different things. And we could do that a number of different ways, but the way that I thought would be most prudent, um, given that um, we have a lot on our general meeting agendas, was that we could have audit committee meetings four times a year that are for the full board to attend for the purpose of Ms. Barr reporting to the full board and for the full board to ask questions and to learn what the Office of Internal Audit does and to understand the different types of work that the Office of Internal Audit does. And so if we do that, then we can fulfill the need to engage the full board on things that I'm hearing from the full board that they want to be engaged in in a way that doesn't have to fit into the general meeting agenda, which is already very full, and we can do it within the committee structure. So I wanted to start a conversation about that and see what the committee thinks of this. Ms. Causey. So I'm gonna turn my camera on for this one. I think this is a fantastic idea. Um, 
we know that uh, our board meetings are very full, but we also know that um, the Office of Internal Audit is has a very important function um, for the board and for the school system at large. Um, so I think a meeting that is specifically designed for the full board um, would be very helpful. And also the fact that the um, audit committee meetings are now live streamed, so they are open to the public, um, that that allows us to have the full board involved uh, per the Opens Meetings Act, and it uh, provides an opportunity for full board um, questions and comments and, and discussion. So I, I think that's a wonderful idea. Mr. Kuhn, did you have any questions or comments? No, I think that um, it would make sense for, for the Audit Committee and Ms. Barr to engage with the full board to provide them insight into the functions that uh, we focus on and what exactly um, we're providing uh, to the organization. So I fully agree with it, and I'm hopeful we can find the time necessary to do it. Okay. Um, will someone make a motion for the committee chair to facilitate these quarterly meetings for the purpose of the Office of Internal Audit to report to the full board? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Ms. Jamison, will you call a roll call vote, please? I actually have a question. If we could. Oh, just you want to discussion? Okay, what's the yeah. question? So, my, so just so that I'm clear, are you talking about um, um, a presentation that um, you and or Ms. Barr or combination makes at a full regular board meeting, or are you talking about a, a separate quarterly meeting of some sort? I'm talking about an audit committee meeting, which as the chair of audit committee, I will chair. That will be a work session for the purpose of the full board to ask internal audit questions and for uh, Ms. Barr to be able to present to the full board items of interest to the full board and for the full board to gain understanding in what the Office of Internal Audit does. But they would be committee meetings attended by the full board, not, and they would be committee meetings that are um, presentational in nature, so there would be no motions. It would be simply an agenda to receive reports and ask questions. Okay, so my follow-on question, and I guess this is, my only concern is that when we have more than a, a quorum of board members meeting anywhere, it turns into a, a de facto board meeting. So I don't well, quite understand how we could have an audit committee meeting that's the entire board. That's my only concern. I don't quite know the mechanics of it. And if you can figure them out, then I'm more than willing to support. Yeah, them. it would sort of function like a committee of the whole almost. Ms. Causey? So, Ms. Rowe, currently for our standing committees, they have um, their set committee members. Um, but when um, Ms. Hen and I um, became chair and vice chair in December of 2018, in uh, January, February 2019 timeframe, uh, in terms of the operating procedures, we opened up the committee meetings for other board members to attend. So it would be a committee meeting other board members could be involved in hearing the presentations, asking questions about the presentations, um, but they did not have the ability to vote in that committee. So that's how it could be processed. It has been um, uh, um, I confirmed, if you will, by Ms. Howie in uh, one of the policy review committee meetings that we had early on, uh, where I think we had eight committee, eight, excuse me, eight members of the board at the policy review committee meeting. But since the whole meeting was open to the public, then it's not a violation of the Opens Meetings Act. Okay, so then there's nothing wrong with the, the suggestion. And in fact, we had a board member who asked specifically in the last board meeting for this presentation. And I've spoken to her and she is amenable to this solution. Um, so, if there's no Open Meetings Act, then I think we can do this. 
The only difference would be instead of just having committee meetings and board members know they can come if they want to, what we would be doing is specifically inviting all of the board members to attend the meeting and putting it on their calendar so that they understand this is their opportunity to attend and hear a report from the Office of Internal Audit about what they do, um, et cetera. So the, so Ms. Uh, Rowe, so the agenda would be set in the normal committee meeting agenda setting fashion, and it would be specifically designed for the full board. So yes, it would okay. be instead of, because our, our agendas, the way they are now and the way our meetings are now, have a substantial workflow and things come up fairly annually. And I'm concerned that it might make our committee meetings run long. And so the suggestion is to have four additional meetings quarterly. The purpose of those four meetings is so that Ms. Barr can quarterly address the full board and it will be an agenda that is reports only. So it will not have the full agenda that ordinarily would have. There would be no business. So when you have an agenda that's reports, it allows Ms. Barr to give a report and it allows board members to ask questions. But there would be, and, and it would be a full amount of time that people can do that so they can satisfy their understanding and their learning process of what the Office of Internal Audit does. Because the board is accountable for overseeing this office and the board members need to be able to feel satisfied that they understand it. Um, so to that end, this format allows question and answers for a, a good period of time, however long the meeting is, without having to incorporate workflow and motions and things like that. Ms. Kazi. So um, thank you for that explanation. And I would, um, I would suggest um, working with Ms. Barr on the regular audit committee agendas to see if there's um, some efficiencies so that it would not be for additional audit committee meetings. I'm thinking of staff and staff have families and have, you know, um, evening activities. Um, so I, I would just make that suggestion. We can discuss that. Um, I guess the point would be, I think that also the full board would be served by not having to sit through an entire workflow agenda to attend an informational, because what I happens is- I agree with is, you, yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. That's why I was asking if it would be an agenda specifically designed for the full board. Right. And if there's that, a way that we can move audit committee work on one side and the other side of that. Of well, that what we but, could do, what we could do is since the full board has to approve the work plan, hang on, um, I'm in a meeting. Can you please turn around and go out the door? Thank you. Sorry. I had laundry launch itself into the room. Um, so, lost my train of thought here. Okay, so what we could do is, since the work plan is, if, if the charter stands would be approved by the full board, what we might be able to do is, in these four meetings, incorporate things that the full board needs to approve into, into this. But I, I feel like that muddies the water somewhat for the public. So if the work plan needs to be approved in a full board meeting, then it needs to be on the full board agenda for voting. And I think that the purpose of these committee meetings is informationally so that the board can ask questions. And as soon as we start adding work and motions and voting into it, it starts to get into a, a, a different type of a thing. And so possibly we can do this and not have four, I guess, we need to, I need the committee to authorize me to facilitate this. And then I can discuss with Ms. Barr precisely what the topics of interest are and discuss with board members precisely what the topics of interest are and then move forward from there. But we're certainly not going to have more meetings than we have to have. 
Great. Can we vote? Yes. Ms. Jamieson, would you call the vote, please? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. 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 Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Joes? I believe she's absent. I believe she left the meeting. Thank you. Okay, the vote carries. And that is the last item on the agenda. Can I have a motion? Oh, Ms. Causey? So did we um, skip over the charter for the Office of Internal Audit? So, no, kind of. Um, my intention with the agenda is to have those two things grouped together and to move through the agenda. And those two items will simply sit on the agenda until we work through them. And I wasn't sure how long this final item would take to discuss. So we hadn't really gotten to that. We do have a few minutes um, before 6.30 that we could start to engage in that conversation and go through that, or we can simply move it to the next meeting. And again, if committee members want to email me their suggestions for what edits need to be made or questions, we can also facilitate those questions through email. So do we want to adjourn or do we want to go into that document? Ms. Causey? If Ms. Barr just wanted to take a few minutes and just walk through um, any of the edits that, that have occurred and her rationale for them or um, anything that she thinks is important to highlight in just a few minutes that we have. Um, Ms. Barr, would you do this, please? Sure. So the edits that were made on, on both documents actually were as a result of the review of, of Ms. Bressler's comments. So I had the entire Office of Internal Audit staff review Ms. Bressler's comments. And uh, by consensus, um, I made those changes. So all those changes that were made um, to both documents, actually, the Audit Committee Charter and the Internal Audit Charter are as a result of Ms. Bressler's review and those were the changes that the office accepted. Quick question, Ms. Bard. Are you are you saying that uh, that you accepted all of the changes that Ms. Bressler suggested? No, we did not. Are the ones that you did not accept highlighted so that we can review them? They're still in um, Ms. Bressler's documents. If you if you have those documents um, available, if not, I can resend them or Ms. Rowe can resend those. So, um, if yeah. you don't have it, Mr. Kuhn, I'm happy to resend you Ms. Bressler's documents. One of the things that that I noticed in looking through is many of her comments were not necessarily suggestions for direct edits, but questions. And in reviewing some of those questions, it, it, it became apparent that what we need is a companion document that's like an orientation explanations. And Ms. Barr and I had discussed attaching that document to um, the audit committee charter. You know, things like explanations of the different types of reports, different types of audits, investigations, reviews, um, a, a glossary. You know, simply so that somebody who's reading that charter would have an understanding of what the terminology means, because in some cases, the questions, when the terminology was understood, the text of the charter was fine. It's just that the terminology wasn't understood. And so we're working on some companion documents to outline that sort of thing. Ms. Causey? Thank you for... Um that answer. Um, thank you for the highlights, Ms. Barr, and thank you for that answer, Ms. Rowe. Um, I would just point out that in Policy Review Committee, we have um, a policy that's under review 
policy 8311 meetings, and there are some issues in there, especially that have um, come forward because of the pandemic and having remote meetings, where there's some more technical information that's helpful. Um, so they are in an appendix to the policy. So there is precedent for having, um, as you said, a, a, an additional document um, that provides more definitions or, in this case, um, technical information that's helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions related to that document? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Jamison, will you call the vote, please? Aye. Yes, Mr. Kuhn? Aye. Uh, Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes, absent. Ms. Rowe? Yes. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everyone.